Okay, I'll just. Mm -mm. Hold hey. on. No, group tech support. Uh, Jeff okay, Chamberlain. Well. All I see is you, Jeff. Okay, <sighs> well, uh, well, we'll let Commissioner Hess uh, has joined the meeting. Thank you for joining us tonight and welcome to the June 1st, 2020 Kalamazoo City Commission meeting. Uh, it's being broadcast tonight on the city's Facebook page and the city of Kalamazoo's YouTube channel. Uh, if you'd like to leave a three minute public comment, you may do so by calling area code 269-226-6573. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Kalamazoo Mayor David Anderson. Thank you very much, uh, DCM Chamberlain. So the first thing is I want to call this meeting of Monday, June 1st, 2020 to order. Once again, we are doing a public meeting, but we are doing it via electronic media. Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Sorry. I was on mute. Commissioner Cunningham. Here. Commissioner Hess. Present. Commissioner Knott. Here. Commissioner Pradle. Present. Commissioner Urban. Here. Vice Mayor Griffin. Here. Mayor Anderson. Here. Thank you so much, Clerk Borley. <laughs> For our opening ceremony tonight, we are lucky enough to have uh, Bishop Daniel Cunningham, who's a uh, currently at a protest in Kalamazoo, as well as doing double duty here at the commission. We appreciate that very much. Thank you, sir. So first thing is invocation with Bishop Daniel S. Cunningham from the Empowerment Center. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor Anderson, and also to the city commissioners. God bless you. Um, I wanna say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity for allowing me to be in this forum and to bring some um, principles that we can go forth. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your wisdom upon this group of leaders and the courage to address proper, unpopular, even challenging areas that face our city. I speak that this group of leadership right now will make the right choices in moving forward for our city. I pray for civil righteousness to prevail as we consciously make a right decision for this city in these challenging times. I speak a spirit of unity and oneness and justice in our city. And I speak your choicest blessings upon each of our commissioner, commissioners and their family. Humbly in your son's name, in Jesus name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Bishop Cunningham. We have a couple proclamations tonight. The first one is Justice Against Bullying, School Awareness Month. And our, our great community member and activist, Gwendolyn Hooker is here with us this evening. And she asked for this proclamation. This proclamation is gonna be read by Jean Hess. Justice Against Bullying, at School, Awareness Month, June, 2020. Justice against, whereas, justice against bullying at school, or J-A-B-S, has served the youth impacted by bullying in Kalamazoo since 2006. And whereas during that time, JABS has raised awareness and provided education, support, and empowerment to over 200 youth who have been affected by bullying in some way. Mm -hmm. And whereas JABS, has strongly, JABS strongly supports the inclusion of students in the development of anti-bullying policy making process and provides a platform to form and organize student groups to advocate for their own right to a safe, bully-free, nonviolent educational space. And whereas anti-bully initiatives like JABS are, pro are proving to be transformative in combating the childhood traumatic effects of bullying in academic environments, as well as enhancing better outcomes for students. Now, therefore, on behalf of the 53rd City Commission, 
I, David F. Anderson, Mayor of the City of Kalamazoo, do hereby recognize June 2020 to be Justice Against Bullying at School, or JABS, Awareness Month, and call on all citizens to recognize and support Justice Against Bullying at School for strengthening our community and holding on to the promise for everyone, especially the school-aged youth of Kalamazoo. Signed, David F. Anderson, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Hess. We have Ms. Gwendolyn Hooker with us this evening. Are there any words that you would like to say? Mayor Anderson, as well as Commissioner uh, Chris Prado and all the other we are of the uh, especially when we know that, uh, especially during this time, when it's even more prevalent not only at schools, but at homes, as I believe, and we are very to a proclamation as we endeavor to raise awareness and reach out to the I think we've lost her internet connection. Okay, so I'm sorry about that. I just wanna say well, thank you once again to Gwendolyn Hooker for bringing this issue forward. I know it's something that she cares deeply about, works on every day. So thank you very much. We have another proclamation. It's gonna be read by Jack Urban. It's on the National Gun Violence Awareness mm -hmm. Day. Commissioner Urban. Yes. National Gun Violence Awareness Day, Kalamazoo, June 5th, 2020. Whereas every day more than 100 Americans are killed by gun violence, and on average, there are more than 13,000 gun homicides every year. And Americans are 25 times more likely to die by gun homicide than people in other high-income countries. And whereas, Michigan has 1,187 gun deaths every year with a rate of 11.8 deaths per 100,000 people. Michigan has the 30th highest rate of gun deaths in the United States. And whereas cities across the nation, including in Kalamazoo, are working to end the senseless violence with evidence-based solutions. And Whereas protecting public safety in the communities they serve is mayor's highest responsibility. And whereas support for the second amendment rights of law abiding citizens goes hand in hand with keeping guns away from people with dangerous histories. And whereas mayors and law enforcement officers know their communities best, are the most familiar with local criminal activity and how to address it, and are best positioned to understand how to keep their citizens safe. And whereas with the COVID-19 health pandemic facing America has drastically impacted communities and individuals sheltering in place, which may result in situations where access to firearms results in increased risk in intimate partner violence, gun deaths, suicide by gun, and, and unintentional shootings. And whereas to honor the Americans whose lives are cut short due to gun violence and the countless survivors who are injured by shootings, a national coalition of organizations has designated June 5th, 2020 as the sixth National Gun Violence Awareness Day. And whereas by wearing orange on June 5th, 2020, Americans will raise awareness about gun violence and honor the lives of gun violence victims and survivors. And whereas we renew our com commitment to reduce gun violence and pledge to do all we can to keep firearms out of the wrong hands and encourage responsible gun ownership to help keep our children safe. Now, whereas, whoops, now therefore, on behalf of the 53rd City Commission, I, David F. Anderson, Mayor of the City of Kalamazoo, do hereby declare June 5th, 2020 as National Gun Violence Awareness Day 
in Kalamazoo and encourage all citizens to support our community efforts to prevent the tragic effects of gun violence and to honor and value human lives. Signed, David F. Anderson, Mayor. Thank you very much. Long, uh, long resolution. Thank you very much, Commissioner Urban. Now we are to adoption of our formal agenda. Commissioners, do you have before you the agenda for tonight's meeting? Are there any changes you'd like to see? I'm seeing no changes. Next item is communications. Are there any communications, City Manager Ritzma? Yes, Your Honor. I just want to start by um, acknowledging the events that occurred over this past weekend. Uh, we had a couple of protests here in Kalamazoo, uh, one on at noon on, on Saturday and one in the evening on Saturday. I understand there were there's been questions raised about uh, what took place at the event and the, and the why um, of what took place. Uh, I've asked Chief Thomas to, to talk about what happened in, in terms of uh, perspective of public safety and how they responded. And I just wanna start out by saying that um, we stand in solidarity with protesters that are protesting legitimate concerns, deep-seated concerns, and we want to be there with them side by side. Unfortunately, we have what appears to be outside agitators and people that want to resort to violence and, and destruction, and that's what we are concerned about. So I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Thomas and she can explain the events of, of Saturday evening. Thank you, Mr. Manager, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, I thank you for this time. And I just like to walk through um, some of the events on Saturday and hopefully answer some questions that are out there. You know, and KDPS mourns with the country, the horrific death of Mr. Floyd in Minneapolis. And we admire those who want their voices heard and respect everyone's right to peacefully protest. And uh, public safety received some inquiries and comments relative to the activities that occurred on Saturday and May 30th during the protests in downtown Kalamazoo. And I'd like to explain the situation that occurred, which prompted KDPS's response of officers in riot gear. So when we uh, began planning that day for the overall strategy to manage large crowds and the protests, um, which we had anticipated, our goal was to provide security for protesters and associated peaceful activities. So we went into it knowing that one of the goals was uh, to march in, uh, in certain streets and in certain locations. And we wanted to provide that security when we wanted to block the streets. We wanted to allow that to occur as well as movement um, of those protesters. Um, our intention was to be purposeful about our presence, yet visibly in the background, so that as many folks wanted to gather could, and we would maintain their safety. We always worry about large crowds and those wanting to do harm on large crowds using vehicles or other manners, and we really wanted to make sure that none of that here occurred at either event. We had... Uh, Two events scheduled that we knew of that day, one at noon and one at 5 p.m. Uh, we were unable to make contact with either organizer, um, so we weren't sure of the route or the planned duration of either of those events while well, we planned. So approximately, just a little context, approximately two years ago, um, KDPS created what was called the crowd management team so this is a team that regularly trains to respond to large crowds that uses national best practices and understanding crowd dynamics um, and responding to events that draw large crowds. We're one of very few trained crowd management teams in the state. And uh, it's a team of approximately 24 officers and they can respond to different events anywhere from soft clothes up to full protective gear. 
Um, and one of the reasons we formed that team is we saw a need as people gather um, to peacefully protest around the country. We had seen um, many agencies have uh, uh, in the media just a line of SWAT officers in full SWAT gear or officers just spraying pepper spray in order to manage large crowds. And we didn't want that image for public safety. We wanted another more professional manner to handle large crowds. And so we've had that team for approximately two years and been training them. Um, we were aware of the two protests on Saturday and the one on noon drew several hundred and the one around 5 p.m. Um, we estimate grew to approximately 3,500 to 4,000 protesters. The protest was peaceful and mar marched down various streets in Kalamazoo as public safety officers blocked those streets and then rerouted that traffic. And I have a couple video clips I just want to show here um, tonight. In one, the first one that I'm going to show you, um, I, I've been told I don't know if I can talk over the video, so I'm just going to describe it and then have him start the clip. And it just shows um, an overall view, I think it was from Exchange Place, of the size of the crowd. I think they're going to play that clip. You can see the beginning of the crowd all through. It, it does not show the end of the crowd and how big um, that crowd was as it marched down uh, Michigan Avenue in that clip. And that was approximately, I would say, around 5.15 p.m. But I just want to give an overview of what we're talking about. And in a crowd like that, the, the beginning of the crowd, the middle of the crowd, um, it's all marching in the same direction, but everyone doesn't necessarily know what's going on in different parts of that um, in different parts of that protest or in that crowd. So at approximately 7 p.m. in one area of the crowd after they had marched and they had stopped on Michigan near the mall. Uh, the mall had, um, uh, had a lot of protesters on it to the south. Many were on Michigan um, Avenue. And in one area of the crowd, two Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety cruisers with public safety officers inside were surrounded by a very vocal and emotional group of protesters. And there was an increasing level of agitation with that group that had surrounded the officers. The officers relayed their situation back to the officers in command asking for assistance um, to get out of that crowd. It was during that situation that the crowd management team was called to extract the officers. We had hoped to extract the police cruisers also um, because what we've seen in other locations is um, if you leave a police car or police cruiser, they become a target. Um, often people want to light them on fire, turn them over. But our main goal was to extract the public safety officers and hopefully those cruisers too. And so we called upon um, our crowd management team in order to extract those uh, officers and those cruisers. And I'm going to show a real um, short video clip that was taken off Facebook. It's a 15-minute video clip. We've taken just two little snippets of that because it had strong, explicit language, um, but it shows a little indication of how close that, that crowd in that point of the protest, probably unknown to most other protesters of what was going on about that cruiser, and then talking about how they have that cruiser um, surrounded and those officers surrounded as they taunt them. So this is two this is short little clips. No justice! 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 No
of what those officers were experiencing and why they wanted to be extracted out of that situation. Um, the crowd management team responded to the scene in two vans on the east side of the crowd where officers were trapped. They were in fully um, marked protective equipment uh, called riot gear by um, some. And upon their arrival and exiting the vehicle and forming the line, the crowd shift their focus away from those enveloped police officers and cruisers, allowing KDPS to extract both the officers and the cruisers. Uh, and we're gonna watch a video of it here in a minute and I don't know if I'll be able to talk over it. Um, but one of the techniques is to try to folk, to shift the attention of the crowd away um, from what's causing agitation. And you'll be able to see that on the video that once the crowd management team arrived and lined up, that the entire crowd shifted to see what that was. And we were able um, to get those cruisers and those officers out because the entire crowd moved forward. Our goal also was to get the, the uh, protesters um, moving again um, so that we could make, have that crowd move versus stay in one location. Uh, when crowds, too large crowds stay in one location and then get bored, um, that's when we tend to see um, acts happen that we don't wanna see. Um, Upon uh, arrival, they, they formed a line and uh, those vehicles exited, were able to exit, um, but the crowd quickly surrounded that crowd management team. And once surrounded, um, and those vehicles were then taken out, the crowd management team was told to exit the, exit the area also. We only brought the crowd management team in to handle that situation and then have them um, exit and go back to their staging area. Um, the crowd management team um, had moved the crowd by the techniques they know, which is move back, which is forcibly moving the crowd. And then when they had to exit that crowd, um, they pushed their way backwards out to those vans um, and return to the staging area. Their total time of involvement um, in this five and a half to six hour protest was a little over 12 minutes. We had had them there over 12 hours that day in a staging area in case they were needed. They were never at any other protests um, in their gear, um, assisting with anything else that was all done by um, public safety officers. And I know uh, before we watch the video real quick, I know Vice Mayor Griffith and Commissioner Cunningham had contacted me um, about some video they had seen relative to the crowd management team. I have not seen that video, all of it yet, and I will be looking into that and reporting back to them on that incident. Um, if we can bring up that clip. So uh, the audio is not on this. So can you hear me? If someone can shake their head, they can hear me talking. So what you'll see at the top of the screen are the two white vans. That's where our crowd management team was located. In the middle, you'll see the cruisers engulfed by people. So, and you'll hear on some videos that, oh, the riot squad is here. And you see the entire crowd at, that's at that portion shift to go see what's going on with that crowd management team. Um, and that was sort of the distraction, it was the distraction technique used to try to get them to move and we, we start backing those um, cruisers out of there. You can also see the things that are being thrown at the officers um, while they stand in that line and they're lining up here. They're then going to try to get that crowd to move. You'll see some cruiser, cruisers uh, 
back out of here as they're able to. Now you can't see off screen to the right, there's a lot of people down the mall in that area. And you also can't see half a block away is another line of just regular patrol officers that have been doing um, the traffic control standing in case that crowd management team could not extract those officers. Uh, you see them here, they are gonna move into the crowd. They are going to move that crowd. You'll see the car, there's a car at the bottom that is exiting, one of the cruisers is exiting as we move in, in here. It's a little choppy, it's much smoother when I watch it on my computer, I'm just panning over. This was taken by a citizen uh, in exchange place and passed on to us. That other cruiser is moving back here in a minute. Now we're moving the crowd, trying to get them to start walking. And then I think it pans out. Uh, officers never deployed uh, any pepper spray, any chemical munitions. This other car moves as that crowd moves. And then it zooms. Okay, we're all we're all set with that clip. And I just want to say I fully understand that the that the sight of officers in riot gear was shocking and it was traumatizing, and especially to those that were protesting peacefully and fully unaware of what was occurring in addition a different portion of that protest. Um, the crowd management team, in order uh, to extract those officers, create that distraction, had to go in at a different portion of that crowd. And I'm sure that crowd didn't know what was happening at the other end as those officers were being surrounded and taunted. Our, our intent was never to increase the agitation of the crowd. It wasn't to get the crowd riled up. It was, a lot, it was to allow the extraction of the officers and the cruisers and to move the crowd to prevent a volatile action. You know, I, I really do want to apologize if anyone thought our motives and actions were different. I'd like to highlight that night we had zero injuries to any protesters, zero injuries to officers, um, zero arrests that night, that entire day, no pepper spray, no tear gas was deployed, no damage to property. And I'm really thankful for that because this was a peaceful protest, but there were portions and times when it became a volatile situation which had to be trained which had to be managed uh, with trained law enforcement techniques for the safety of the officers and protesters. And this was only utilized when necessary and it was withdrawn when the situation was handled. Um, that other line of officers who was waiting for the extraction of the crowd management team was also dispersed to go on and do crowd control. We saw that crowd shift after we got the other two cruisers out um, of trying to surround other vehicles and we moved our techniques and moved those back at that point. Um, so that we would not find ourselves in another situation surrounded without an egress. Um, I, before I forget, I want to address one other thing because it brought to my attention the question of the SWAT officer and the photo out there of the SWAT officer on top of the Radisson. We did have one SWAT officer. Uh, we have a Kalamazoo Metro SWAT team. Um, employees uh, trains many different, one of which is a sniper. And we had them on one at stage on one of the buildings on top um, downtown. And that was because we were trying to verify information we had received that perhaps some folks were gonna show up. Um, uh, some second amendment and open carry folks were gonna show up and we uh, wanted to make sure we were prepared for any uh, thing that may occur. Um, as we look ahead and prepare for other protests, I just want to cover that because I do have to leave this meeting and go attend to some other protests and activities that are going on. Um, but we know there's other protests scheduled here locally, some unscheduled, and we really pray for peaceful events. Um, but it's my responsibility to ensure the safety of all those involved for the protesters and the officers. That lies on my shoulders for this entire city. And I take that very, very seriously. Um, in other cities, we've seen instigators come to scheduled protest events and make it something it's not intended to be. Um, we have intelligence, 
credible intelligence that that may occur here in Kalamazoo, which means that Kalamazoo Public Safety may have to respond to a level to maintain the safety for all. And that may include at some point down the road a pepper spray or tear gas or curfews. And all of those will only be used as a last resort and only when absolutely necessary. We have a plan and we're prepared to respond to the best of our ability to keep this, this city safe. And that's what we want. We don't want outside agitators creating a situation of something that is supposed to, to speak and allow everyone to have their voices heard. Um, you know, I know I, along with everyone here, we pray for unity for our city and our country. Um, and we want to keep this community safe. City manager, I think that's all I have. Thank you. And as Carrie Ann mentioned, um, both her and I are going to have to jump off this call after this um, to as we're needed in the emergency operations center. Mayor, I don't know if you want to um, take some questions, if there are any. So commissioners, are there any questions for the chief while she is still present? No. Okay, I don't see any questions. I, I also just want to remind people that uh, there was a extended period today where uh, Manager Ritzma and Chief Carrie Ann Thomas did reach out uh, and connected with all the commissioners so that the commissioners could be up to date on what happened as well. Uh, certainly, I don't know if we're doing the best job that we can, but we're going to try to do a better job in terms of communicating, keeping everybody up to date so that we have as much real-time information as we can. And the reason that is so important is that our major news sources now for most of us is social media. And it's very hard to discern on social media whether something's being said is a fact or not a fact, is a threat. And so we, we really wanna make sure we can do the best job we can to communicate with each other and the community. So thank you, Manager Risma. I know you wanna say something else. Thank you for your report, uh, Chief Thomas. Manager Risma. Yeah, just real quick. And um, I know this is, very difficult for a lot of people right now. Everything is tense right now. There's a lot of emotions. We recognize that. We just ask for patience from our community. Again, we're with you and supportive of the protest and we hope to be getting to work on the underlying and overall issues that need to be addressed here in Kalamazoo. But I also really want to acknowledge and stand behind Chief Thomas. Um, She's been in the middle of all this, and I know that's her job. It, it's her heart, too. And she is taking this personally and loves this community. And so I stand behind her and her officers who are trying to do this work in these very difficult times. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Manager Rispa. So I see no other questions here. I understand that Manager Risma, that you're going to be leaving with the chief then? Correct, and Jeff Chamberlain is going to be taking over for me. Okay, thank you, sir, thank you. appreciate it. Uh, so Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, I, there you are, okay. Uh, I understand that this is the time on our agenda for public comments, and you've been involved in collecting those. Do we have public comments? Yes, sir, we do. We will get those um, queued up for you right now. Uh, my name is Tom Beach. I live in the city. Uh, my address is 3428 Bronson Boulevard. I have two questions that I hope will be discussed at this evening's city commission meeting. Uh, first, what is the city's and particularly the, the Public Service Department's uh, policy with respect to the use of force? And second, what are the city's policies with respect to termination uh, and uh, discipline if, some of, if the policies that uh, the city has with respect to the use of force are violated by 
police officers or public service officers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Hello, my name is Stacy Ledbetter, and I am a former employee in the city of Kalamazoo, Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety. Greetings, the mayor, vice mayor, commissioners, and city leaders. I am black and blue, entrenched in both black woman, black husband, black adult son, black perspective, protecting, serving, respecting, listening, connecting, teaching, learning, fellowshipping, building positive relationships. My blue, a career in law enforcement for over 25 years, protecting, serving, respecting, listening, connecting, teaching, learning, fellowshipping, building positive relationships. My black is a lived experience from birth that firsthand knows that racism and discrimination are real and that they have to be dealt with head on, which powers that be are very uncomfortable with. My blue was a lived experience for over two decades that firsthand knows that community policing can't just be a catchphrase, that community perception is reality until you show and prove otherwise, that respect for and knowledge of the community that you serve has to be instilled even before the job offer, and that no group or identity of people, including this profession, should be brushed with a stereotypical broad stroke. But if the shoe fits the individual or system, call it out and shut it down. The history of the institution and implementation of policing in the U.S., from slave patrols to Jim Crow laws and black codes to lynching, to voting rights restrictions, to educational segregation, to opportunity oppression, to past and present unchecked police brutality, to a disparate criminal justice system, to a lack of racially diverse representation of top leaders in law enforcement. If you learn the history of the foundation of this country, because you most likely did not learn about many of the events and laws and acts of resilience, which was and is also by design, you will clearly understand why we have the issues, the disconnect, and the anger that is being exhibited yet today. Please, please move toward doing more focused education, providing information, transparency without being asked, and authentic relationship building with every segment of this community. Feel free to connect with me to assist in this important work. The luxury of delay and denial is no more. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lesbetter. My name is Sarah Ruggles and I live at 623 West Cedar Street in Kalamazoo. I'm also the chair of the Board of the Vine Neighborhood Association. I wonder tonight if the commissioners or the Department of Public Safety can speak to the decision to stop sending KDPS recruits to the KVCC Police Academy. I understand that the academy included a TRHT partnership program called Expanding Our Horizons which features healing circles with the community and workshops on understanding history in relation to racism. The Academy, I am told, also included in their curriculum trainings related to implicit bias de-escalation, suicide prevention, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, Spanish, human trafficking, autism, hearing, and learning disabilities. I've been informed that this is the only police academy in the state of Michigan that has offerings this comprehensive. Discontinuing this program is not the right decision for this time for the officers of Kalamazoo. My second question is, why when our country and our city are in the biggest budget crisis of our lifetimes, is the Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety currently hiring? I thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Tanya Bellamy. I live at 2916 Brook Drive, Burke Acres neighborhood in the city of Kalamazoo. 
I'm a WMU retiree. I currently serve as the team lead for the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation Narrative Change Design Team for History and Education. I'm a mother of three black sons and eight grandsons. As part of TRHT, um, I have participated with the KBCC uh, Police Academy on the Expanding Our Horizons program. That program features healing circles with community and a workshop on U.S. history related to racism. I actually participated in two of those uh, programs, one last year and then the other this year in February, where we had breakfast with recruits, um, participated in healing circles, and then set in on the history lesson um, related to racism in the United States. Additionally, under the leadership of Victor Ledbetter, the KBCC Police Academy has also added topics to their curriculum, implicit bias, de-escalation, suicide prevention, Spanish, ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences, implicit bias, human trafficking, autism, death, learning disabilities. I believe that these topics are essential for officers to learn in order to have better practices and relationships with the community. And I believe that this is the only police academy in the state of Michigan that has offering um, this comprehensive. So after I participated in two of uh, the programs, had great opportunity to get to know young recruits. I thought that I would see them on the street only to find out that uh, KDPS does not send its recruits to Calumet Valley Community College. I, I just want to understand the decision to no longer send KDPS recruits to KBCC Police Academy. I also want to understand is, is that cost effective to send recruits to police academies in, in other cities? Hello, my name is Shalana Lewis. I am a resident of the city of Kalamazoo in the Vine neighborhood, and I am also the director of the Truth, Racial Healing, and Transformation work here in this community. Um, I wanted to share that with recent actions uh, across the country and nationally, uh, we've really been called to think about how all our systems are connected and how we can better live into our values of equity as a community. I understand and I think we can all agree that security, dignity, and humanity is important to every single one of us. And I just wanted to lift up that we have to continue to center that and center our shared humanities um, when we are doing this and dealing with these types of issues that have been um, recently in the news and in our community around police, police issues. Um, how we value the lives of people of color versus officers whose fear and desire for security is more valid and enforced, and how we value profit over and property over lives. Those are all key questions that we want to lift up. And it relates not only to issues of policing, but issues of housing too. Um, myself, along with a few others from Isaac, recently met with a group of landlords um, representing Trop and Denning, Lukeman, Trident, and Arquette Pone properties. Um, and we facilitated this conversation using some of the healing practices. And I wanted to just share with you all that we feel that since we've been engaging with landlords as early as June of 2019, we had a meeting that was a landlord fair, and then we had a meeting at El Concilio in September 19. Both of those events were supported by city staff. Many of the landlords that we continue to hear from were engaged in that, in either one of those um, convening, but we feel that the conversations recently have been more productive in understanding this being built. Um, one of the issues that they raised, the landlords, was about educating current and potential residents about life skills. We feel that while this has nothing to do with the ordinance, it is a concern that they have, and we wanted to let them know and shared with them that there are many resources in the community that already deal with this issue, and that that's not necessarily the focus of the ordinance. 
Um, there are other issues raised, and we encourage them to continue to submit public comment to city staff. We feel that this ordinance cannot wait and the housing equity issues continue to deepen through COVID-19. This ordinance addresses so many issues that are pressing today, including impact of mass incarceration, domestic violence, and other issues that disproportionately affect um, communities of color. We encourage the city to continue to consider pushing forward with the housing equity ordinance as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, our city commissioners and mayor. My name is Sharday Chambers, and I do reside in the city of Kalamazoo. And I'm calling as a concerned citizen to express my displeasure with our Kalamazoo Public Safety Department. After the peaceful protest this weekend, the actions that Kalamazoo Public Safety decided to take when bringing in a riot gear to try to intimidate the crowd that was very peaceful was just very unacceptable. With the climate that is in this environment right now, you don't want to push. And I felt like the police officers, the city, it was just very, it was very shameful. And the chief of police, with her silence, she definitely needs to do better with her department. Because whoever ordered the call for the riot gear, whoever ordered the call for the officers to come out with aggression and intimidation, that was uncalled for. And I'm truly hurt by that. With police brutality going on and deaths of minorities, what was happened Saturday was uncalled for for a peaceful protest. And we have to do better. The mayor, Mr. Mayor, you need to definitely call on our police to do better. To the chief of police, if you're listening tonight, you need to do better because we need to come better and be a united city. We can't be united if we can't even come together with our local authorities without them being aggressive and being disrespectful to the community. That brings no harmony. And you guys need to work on that. I'm speaking for many citizens that feel my concerns because Saturday was uncalled for with the riot gear. That needs to be addressed and you guys need to be better. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, this is Nakia Bayless and I do live within the Kalamazoo city limits. I'd just like to provide a comment about what's going on around the injustices that we're seeing uh, nationwide. Um, at the end of the day, I want to offer the idea that the only way to stop the injustices that we're seeing is to close the power gap and the wealth gap. By closing the power gap, people of color, particularly in this particular case, black people, are well positioned in decision-making positions to ensure that our community is, is well heard and, and, and supported um, appropriately. Uh, I think that by closing the wealth gap, that too lends itself to uh, a change at a level that we've never seen or experienced. When people feel privileged, they act privileged. When you know that you have money coming in, when you know that you can walk into a bank and get a home loan without jumping through 10 hoops of fire, when you know that you can access funding for pretty much anything that you need or want, when you know that you can start a business and you can open it in any place in the city that you so choose, there's privilege in that. And therefore, you behave as someone who is privileged. Black and brown people do not behave, if you will, as privileged because we've never been privileged. Once we close the power and the wealth gap, that changes. That's when we realize equity. That's when we experience equity. That's when systems shift. That's when everybody thrives. That's what it's about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Rachel Myers, and currently I live in Kentwood, Michigan, but the city of Kalamazoo was my home for the past eight years previously. And I felt comfortable returning to Kalamazoo to protest 
um, on behalf of what happened to Mr. George Floyd, um, because I still very much consider Kalamazoo to be where my community is and where my home is. And I wanted to comment on the actions by the police who showed up in riot gear and started pushing the crowd. I was very disturbed by their behavior because from my perspective, it seemed like we were demonstrating peacefully. And my question for you all as the mayor and the city commissioners as to what your actions are going to be to prevent something like this from happening in the future. Thank you for your time. Goodbye. Thank you very much. My name is Karen Dybeck, and I am a proud resident of the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I'm calling um, with a broken heart, as are many residents of Kalamazoo right now. I am a member of the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation team that's working out of the Kalamazoo Foundation. And I'm calling specifically to wonder why the new trainees uh, for the, our Kalamazoo Police Department are being sent out to Lansing for training when there is an outstanding program at the Kalamazoo Valley Community College. TRHT is partnering in the, ex in the Expanding Our Horizons program with racial healing opportunities for these new cadets. There are topics in the curriculum about implicit bias, de-escalation, and a great emphasis on knowing the Kalamazoo community. And this is exactly the kind of policing we need and want and demand in Kalamazoo. Thank you. Thank you. This is Carrie pickett Irway, President and CEO of the Kalamazoo Community Foundation, where we are housed and located within the city limits. Recent acts of violence against communities of color, especially Black African Americans, show they are disproportionately impacted by blatant racism, and there are no circumstances where this is ever acceptable. We recognize the need for greater transparency and accountability from public officials towards anti-racism. We stand in solidarity with communities of color and commit to continue action towards our shared humanity, greater inclusion, and equity for all. We remain committed to working closely with our community leaders, including those with the Truth Racial Healing and Transformation Initiative, the TRHT, and the Anti-Racism Transformation ARTT team of KZCF. We commit to identifying the most concrete action steps for the Community Foundation to take to support communities of color in this moment. And we offer to learn with the city of Kalamazoo and do better together. The Kalamazoo Community Foundation envisions Kalamazoo County as the most equitable place to live. And this can only be possible if we work collectively in removing barriers that prevent individuals and families from reaching their full potential. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Casey Coker, and I've been a resident of Kalamazoo for over 10 years. I currently reside in the Stewart neighborhood. What happened to George Floyd was sadistic and disturbing, and we in Kalamazoo must take steps to address any issues in policing we have here immediately. As many of you know, there was a study done here a few years ago that supported what some of us suspected. Black individuals were stopped disproportionately at disproportionate rates to their white counterparts, thus exposing them to the potential of increased police exposure. That's enough evidence to suggest that we have a problem that needs to be addressed immediately. Systemic racism exists in every institution in this country, and that means we have to address the policies and procedures currently in place for racial bias. We also need to implement education training programs that are developed by people in this community to serve this community by this community. Also, 
I am wondering why the cadets trained at the KBCC uh, Police Academy by members of the community, including myself, are not being funded or sponsored by local law enforcement. It is my understanding that we send cadets to be trained in Lansing. KVCC, under the direction of Dr. Washington and Vic Ledbetter, have an amazing program with a diversity and inclusion and equity component, unlike any I've ever seen or heard of in the country. It also involves members of the community, and I would appreciate having educated and trained cadets be the ones who patrol my neighborhood and community police. Finally, and most importantly, we need to listen to, support, believe, and compensate members of the Black community for their time, their feedback, their energy, their voices. And we need to hear their stories, compensate them for their time, for sharing their stories, so that we know how to directly impact systemic change in law enforcement in Kalamazoo. We need to do this immediately. We cannot have another incident like George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and Breonna Taylor, among many, many others. It is unacceptable in this community. It's unacceptable anywhere. We can do better. We should do better. We will do better. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners and residents of Kalamazoo. I'm Patrick O'Brien, lifelong Kalamazoo resident, city of Kalamazoo, and broker owner of O'Brien Real Estate Incorporated. I have personally been a landlord for 39 years, and my company has managed rentals for almost 60 years. The shortage of housing and lack of affordable housing is a real issue in Kalamazoo. The high cost of new construction is between $150 and $200 a foot, and maybe higher in certain instances. The cost to buy existing buildings and fix them up is also at an all-time high. In addition, the cost to operate rental properties are continuing rising insurance costs, maintenance, property taxes, compliance with ever-changing and expanding lead-based paint, building housing regulations are constantly increasing. Adding additional laws, regulations, and fines to the housing providers will not improve housing stock nor will it make housing more affordable for the underserved population that you're trying to help. With every new regulation comes increased costs to housing providers, costs that must be passed on to the tenants. What really needs to happen is a private or public partnership to work together to provide tax or building incentives to housing providers, along with creative zoning solutions to allow more units in smaller space. Also, most of the current zoning areas in the city of Kalamazoo do not allow micro-housing, which is another path toward affordable housing units. Until the cost to develop affordable rental housing falls or is lower than through private and or public programs, there's no way to add additional and affordable units to the housing stock in Kalamazoo. The proposed ordinance also asks housing providers to solve the affordable housing shortage by lowering their standards to rent to tenants that traditionally would not have passed the background check criteria that most housing providers use. The ordinance asks for housing providers to take on a massive amount of additional risk, and with added risk comes added costs, which have to be passed on to the tenant. Housing providers are asked to abandon their standard tenant selection criteria, which often included rental and eviction history and criminal history, and look at the tenant on a case-by-case -case basis, analyzing the causes of any or criminal convictions. The problem with this is twofold. First, abandoning standardized and objective criteria to screen tenants in favor of making a judgment call on a case-by-case -case basis is opening the housing provider to claims of discrimination or favoritism. Whether there is any basis for these claims or not, whether there are protections in an ordinance against them, these kinds of claims or not, it is very expensive to defend such a claim, even if the claim is baseless. Second, the tenant selection criteria this proposed ordinance is asking housing providers to abandon, eviction history and criminal history, are used because they have been found to by housing providers to be an indicator of poor future performance by tenants. If a tenant did not pay their past landlord and has made no effort to repay that landlord, that does not inspire confidence with a new landlord 
that he will get paid. As we as housing providers are generally not educated nor equipped to determine if someone ha- with a criminal past poses a risk of recidivism, I am educated in finance and real estate. I am not a psychologist, counselor, social worker, or in any way qualified to make a determination as to whether or not someone with a past criminal conviction has moved past that part of their life and can be reasonable tenant and neighbor. The cost of bad tenant goes well beyond a housing provider not being paid and or ending up with a damaged housing unit. One bad tenant can ruin an entire building or even an entire neighborhood. Whether it's driving away good tenants, bringing guests to the property that caused damage to the landlords or other property or other tenants' property or inflict harm on other tenants. Further, we ask that making these kind of judgments without proper education or training, who bears the liability when a housing provider makes a bad judgment call? Many of the changes proposed by the ordinance result in added risk to the housing providers, which will increase the cost of housing within the city of Kalamazoo and will not be completely countered to the goal of the proposed and will be completely counter to the goal of proposed ordinance. In conclusion, I understand that there is a real issue in affordable housing. I don't think the housing right as written will accomplish the goals that it is trying to achieve. Thank you. My name is Zachary Lassiter. I live in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, I want to uh, address uh, the videos that Chief Thomas showed earlier. Um, She talked about how two officers were surrounded and they wanted extraction. In the exact video she showed, you see an officer walk from the outside of the crowd to the cruiser, get into the driver's side of the cruiser, and drive away. That officer clearly was not surrounded. He wasn't even in the vehicle. I think her excuses for her department's behavior are inappropriate, and she must be held accountable along with her department. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, this is Ed Genesis. I am a Kalamazoo resident. I live on the north side. I am also lead organizer for criminal justice reform with Michigan United. I'm a community outreach liaison with Isaac. I do mentoring and lead community work with Speak It For It, and I'm also a racial healing lead with TRHT. What I am lifting up is that I have been a part of different um, KVCC Police Academy, um, the trainings, um, being part of that cohort, actually facilitating and leading some of the healing circles. And I'm wondering why KDPS does not send their um, police academy cadets through Kalamazoo. It is imperative, especially during these times that we build community, which starts with community relations. I am also directly impacted, formerly incarcerated. These things that can help improve community relations begins at home. We should not be sending our public safety officers to learn in other places where they don't even provide public safety. We have a special public safety. We have the largest in the nation and we actually have public safety officers. As we lift them up for the awesome work that they do, We also have to bring them out and call them out for not interacting with the community in ways that can be supportive, helpful, and make sure that we all grow together as a community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was the last public comment, Mayor. Thank you so much, uh, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain. Uh, I want to thank everybody that took the trouble to call in tonight. I know it's not uh, maybe as easy as showing up when we have public meetings and uh, you make your recording and can't go back and change it. So I appreciate you taking that risk and uh, saying all the important things that need to be said. So I appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Next on our agenda is our consent agenda. There are several items on that consent agenda. 
Uh, Deputy City Manager Chamberlain, are you gonna be reading those items? Yes, sir. Uh, we have nine items on the consent agenda tonight. First is approval of the purchase of Microsoft Office 365 annual licenses from CWG through the My Deal Cooperative Purchasing Program in the amount of $142,507.95. Next is approval of a sole source purchase with Ferguson Waterworks for the installation of 12 water meter gateway collectors in the amount of $273,720. Next is approval of a professional service agreement with Peerless Midwest Incorporated for well 4-6A completion in the amount of $146,545.50. Next is adoption of a resolution setting a public hearing on the 2019 to 2023 consolidated plan and the 2019 action plan submittal amendment and the draft 2020 action plan and budget as required by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Next is adoption of a resolution to authorize membership in the Michigan Water Wastewater Agency Response Next Network. Next is the approval of an amendment to the recently adopted social equity policy so as to be consistent with recent changes to the state's social equity program. Next is authorization of a settlement of a claim from Icon Properties for a sewer backup that occurred in August of 2019 at 1319 Lafayette Street in the amount of $26,454.54. Next is authorization for the city manager to execute the proposed extension of the wastewater agreement with the village of Vicksburg. And finally, approval of the sale of a portion of Eastern Hills Golf Course to the state of Michigan in the amount of $9,400. And this property is needed for the construction of a roundabout located at Gull Road and G Avenue. That is all. Thank you very much, TCM Chamberlain. Commissioners, the requested action is to approve items one through eight, postpone item nine until June 15th, 2020, and authorize the city manager to sign all documents on behalf of the city. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Cunningham, support by Commissioner Knott. Clerk Borley, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Hess. Yes. Commissioner Knott. You're muted, Commissioner Knott. Sorry about that, yes. Okay. Commissioner Pradel. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. You are muted also, there you go. Yes. Okay. Thank you, commissioners. The items on the consent agenda are approved. Uh, next items are those on the regular agenda, uh, DCM Chamberlain. Yes. First is adoption of a resolution affirming the adoption of the Winchell Neighborhood Plan 2020 as a subplan to the City of Kalamazoo's Comprehensive Plan. Um, I believe tonight we have uh, Katie Riley from the Community Planning and Economic Development Department, and we also have uh, Neighborhood President Pete Kushner uh, on, the, on the line tonight. So... Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add or? Yeah, I'll just uh, do a quick overview. So good evening, con commissioners. Uh, I'm Katie, I'm the neighborhood activator. Since 2018, uh, I've been working with the Oakland Drive Winchell Neighborhood Association to create a neighborhood plan. The neighborhood plan identifies goals related to connectivity, land use, environmental responsibility, safe community, complete neighborhoods and good governance. Uh, to create the plan, the committee, committees were created that focused on neighborhood priorities and they were led by residents, each committee. The, um, throughout the planning process, the committees utilized neighborhood meetings, focus groups and surveys to develop goals and worked with city staff to ensure achievable actions. Um, and so now I'm happy to introduce Pete Kushner, president of the Oakland Drive Winchell Neighborhood Association to tell you more about the plan from the neighborhood's perspective. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Katie. I, I appreciate that. And good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Thank you for taking the time to go over and listen to our plan. Um, you know, we spent almost three years on our plan, and 
I personally am very proud of being able to take an all volunteer neighborhood association and build a plan. Uh, I would like to thank city staff for working with us throughout the process, uh, especially thanking uh, Katie uh, as a neighborhood activator and Christine Anderson, who those were the two city staff members that we worked with uh, hand in hand to uh, build this plan. Uh, the thanks and the credit by far go to our neighborhood and our volunteers. Uh, at one point we had close to 50 volunteers on our five committees all working to put this together. We've had uh, over, uh, I think it was three in-person uh, open houses, uh, countless emails received, uh, many variations and, and versions of our neighborhood plans. So I believe that it uh, accurately uh, represents uh, what Oakland Drive Winchell would like to see in our neighborhood. Uh, I can also tell you, uh, commissioners and mayor, that uh, I've had many people reach out that are also ready for the next step, which is implementing the plan and working with city staff as well as other neighbors uh, and our partners uh, in other neighborhoods and um, throughout the city to begin, to begin the process of implementing the plan. So I just wanted to, to mention all those uh, groups and neighbors that made, the, that made this happen. Couldn't have happened without everybody's uh, support and work. Uh, thank you very much, Pete Kushner. It is an uh, amazing accomplishment. That's a lot of work and a lot of hours. So I appreciate that work a great deal. And please pass on to everyone who's involved in the neighborhood, uh, participating in creating this plan that we are very, very appreciative of that effort. Uh, at this time, is there, are there any discuss, uh, questions from the commission for either the neighborhood activator, Katie Riley or uh, Pete Kushner? Any discussion on the plan? I saw a hand go up, but I'm not sure. No discussion? All right. Clerk Borling, uh, the recommended action is to adopt this uh, resolution and approve the plan. Is there a motion? I move that. Support. Motion made by Commissioner Urban. Support. Supported by Commissioner Hess. Is there any discussion? Clerk Barling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Knott. Yes. Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess. Yes. Thank you, commissioners. The motion passes. Deputy City Manager Chamberlain. Thank you. The second item on the regular agenda is approval of the use of 300,000 from the city of Kalamazoo business development fund budget, which was funded from the, Cal the foundation for excellence aspiration fund to create the Kalamazoo micro enterprise grant fund and approval of a budget amendment to allocate the same amount from fund balance. And I, I believe we uh, have uh, Antonio have Mitchell here, uh, is also here. Uh, if there's any further information that Mr. Mitchell can provide to us. I just want to share a little bit. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Vice Mayor, City Commissioners, and um, City Manager for um, letting me and allowing me to uh, speak on this important item. Um, this um, item is another tool for economic development to assist our local businesses here in Kalamazoo. Um, you have already approved earlier um, a small business loan fund um, to work with United Way of Battle Creek and Kalamazoo region. Um, this fund will also be going through that organization as well to assist um, local businesses. Um, the Kalamazoo Micro Enterprise Grant Fund, in this case, will focus on um, businesses less than 10 people, uh, full-time employment. The small business loan fund that you approved for earlier was 50 or less. So this program is really to focus on our um, very small businesses that may have one or two employees that need some assistance. Um, 
this fund will be a $5,000 grant for those businesses. Um, it will try to focus on our um, shared prosperity neighborhoods and businesses in those areas that have a lot of um, single businesses that have a small population um, that need assistance during this time period. Um, this fund has already um, received dollars from the Consumer um, Energy uh, Foundation of $200,000. Um, your funding, um, if approved tonight, will add additional $300,000, which will give um, approximately $500,000 available to assist businesses here in the city of Kalamazoo. Um, this will um, have a significant impact, we feel, um, on our local businesses. Um, with this funding, um, hopefully we will impact over 170 local businesses here in the city. Um, with our existing program with um, CPE and D, uh, we're working with businesses with our business, business development fund. Um, we are working with at least 20, 25 businesses currently, so you can get um, an impact of almost 200 businesses for what the city is doing to work with our economic development um, community and business growth and development, uh, which I think will have a long-term impact on how our businesses survive on this um, trying time that we are in. Um, these funds are also though tied to FFE, um, the Foundation for Excellence. Um, um, this funding that you're gonna be approving will be coming through our business development fund. And that fund was um, um, funded through FFE as well. Um, what you're looking at here um, from these two actions from the Small Business Loan Fund and our uh, Microenterprise Grant Fund is that the city is putting um, around $2.5 million with assistance from the Consumer Energy Foundation into the community to assist businesses locally, which I hope will have um, a significant impact during this COVID-19 time period that will assist our businesses not only in uh, sustaining themselves, but hopefully striving to not only stay open, but uh, expand their capability in the city. Um, I'm willing to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Antonia Mitchell at this time from commission? All right, seeing no questions, the recommended action is a motion to approve the funding allocation and budget amendment. Is there a motion? So moved. Motion made by Commissioner Clark. Cunningham. I'm sorry. Support. Uh, support by Commissioner Prado. Any discussion? Clerk Borling, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Pradle. Yes. Commissioner Urban. Yes. Vice Mayor Griffin. Yes. Mayor Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cunningham. Yes. Commissioner Hess? Yes. Commissioner Knott? Yes. Thank you, Clerk Borling. Uh, thank you, Commission. The motion passes. Next are reports and legislation. Uh, DCM Chamberlain, do you have a report? Nothing further tonight. Uh, Clerk Borling, do you have a report tonight? Uh, yes, I do want to mention that at the end of last week, we mailed out absentee ballot applications to everyone on our permanent uh, absentee uh, ballot request list. Um, that's just over 11,300 people. Um, and to, to put that in perspective, um, in January, in mid-January, that list was at about 4,600. So we've grown that list quite a bit this year. Those, uh, like I said, those applications went out the end of last week and we've already been starting to get quite a few back. Uh, quite a few people are making use of the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the tool where you can just take a picture of your absentee ballot application uh, completed, of course, and email it to us. And, um, and that works uh, great as a way people can, can submit those. So just wanted to report that. Thank you, Clerk Borling. And what, uh, for what election will, is this ballot available then? So the, the election that voters would be uh, requesting ballots for the immediate election is um, the August election, which is a statewide primary election. Um, and, you know, that's not to be confused with the presidential primary that we had uh, 
just a couple months ago, uh, three months ago in March. Um, the August election is a statewide primary for all of the other partisan offices uh, that get elected both uh, state level, federal level, and local level. So that is what um, people will be requesting ballots for with these forms, but the form also lets voters request ballots for the November election. So you can request a ballot just for August. You can request a ballot just for November if you don't want to vote in August or don't want to vote absentee in August, or you can request uh, a ballot for both. So uh, this gives voters um, a few options here. Uh, thank you. So this is their opportunity to choose people who will be on the final ballot in November, correct? That's correct. They would choose, yeah. So you have it's it's basically an opportunity for them to say which, um, you know, if, if uh, you pick one party and then you get to decide which candidates from that party you want to see kind of move on to the next round uh, to the general election. So you would have to pick to vote in for one party or the other. Correct. You have to pick. Uh, you have to pick a party. Um, but uh, unlike March, you don't have to make that requ uh, request in writing because the ballot will have candidates from both parties. You just have to make sure that when you vote, you stay um, stay with that one party. Pick one party and stay with it. Uh, thank you very much, Clerk Borley. Uh, Attorney Robinson, any report tonight? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, briefly, uh, one of the matters that you approved in the consent agenda was a change to the social equity policy that was approved just last week. The reason for that is the day after the commission took action, the state, as was mentioned uh, by DCM Chamberlain, changed their social equity policy and we wanted to bring ours up to date. The, the key change is this, that previously, if an individual had a misdemeanor or a felony marijuana conviction, you received a 25% discount in your fees. Uh, what the state did was change that. So if you have only a misdemeanor conviction, as long as it doesn't involve the delivery to a minor, you get a 25%. If it's a felony conviction, it's a 40% discount. And we wanted to make that discount available to uh, local residents as well under our own uh, fee schedule. So that will go ahead. Your action tonight goes into effect. I don't know if Clerk Borling received a lot of uh, applications today when the, the window was open, but that would be applied to any person eligible for that uh, discount because of your action tonight would be able to take advantage of it. Secondly, uh, we have been doing these virtual meetings for some time now. The governor's executive order permitting such meetings expires near the end of this month. Uh, to that end, um, various municipal attorneys have been wondering, because there's still going to be social distancing, because there's still maybe some problems or maybe some benefit to continuing to have virtual meetings uh, after the executive orders uh, expires, what can be done to address changes in the Michigan Open Meetings Act? And I've been asked to sit on a committee to look at that uh, question and propose uh, legislation. So I wanted to bring your attention to uh, that latest development. Thank you, Attorney Robinson. I, I do have a question. Uh, under what length of time are we authorized at this point to have our, our public meetings in this fashion? When does that expire? And what would be our plans related to that then? Well, I, I, it depends on whether or not that executive order gets extended. I, I'd have, I have, and I've now looked at it in several days. And so I think it's by the end of the month. I want to say the 28th uh, is when it goes through. So the, clearly the next meeting of the city commission will be under that executive order. You can hold it virtually. The question comes, what happens in July? And that is going to be dependent on whether or not that executive order is extended. And if it is extended, whether there are any changes made. Thank you. Now is the time on our agenda for uh, commissioner comments. This time we'll hear from any commissioners who wish to make comments. I, I guess I'll go ahead and start it. Uh, commissioner Urban. Oh, uh, I'll pass for now. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think there are people who want to speak who are much more concise and more elo eloquent than me. So okay. let them go. All right. Uh, okay. 
Uh, I'll let people determine who, who would like to say something. Okay. Commissioner Cunningham? Yeah, yes. Um, so I have a lot of different thoughts and, and concerns. I have had the opportunity to kind of keep an eye on the, also the comment uh, section on the Facebook live feed. And uh, I did want to answer one piece. Uh, they asked if uh, city staff respond to some of the questions that, or will they respond to questions? Uh, and I wanted to say emphatically, yes, uh, we try to uh, get any information that citizens need and resources that citizens need uh, to them as soon as possible. So I first want to start off with that, addressing that. Um, the next piece that I want to speak to, uh, I, I noticed that a lot of individual, individuals asked uh, why we didn't ask uh, the chief any questions after her presentation. Um, and to, to be transparent, uh, I believe myself and all of the colleague, my colleagues on the commission have sat down with chief today uh, at different points to talk through uh, a lot of what we're dealing with. Um, and, you know, I, I want to give, I apologize to uh, the leadership that was in that space, but I also want to apologize to the community and my family, uh, as I'm sure a lot of my colleagues have never heard me curse before. Um, but I think it was a dialogue that needed to be had. Um, and, and, and so, um, you know, with that being said, uh, in regards to our March the, the march over the weekend. Um, you know, I, I want to give some special thank yous to people, citizens who were in, in the crowd who were keeping the peace. Um, specifically, uh, Stephanie Moore. I mean, if you haven't seen a video of her and how she stood up um, for what was right in that moment, um, it, it's inspiring. It's inspiring. And the reality is, um, you know, had that been my wife, my sister, my mother, uh, my daughter, I would have been livid. Um, I would have been livid if individuals weren't standing by her side, if they weren't protecting her. Because in my mind, um, that's a, a responsibility that is supposed to be relied upon for our safety officers. officers. Um, I just wanted to lift that up, highlight that. Um, thank you to uh, David Anderson, Aaron Knott, uh, Patrice, uh, and um, our police department, public safety, for communicating continuously with me throughout this process. Uh, in reality, is it was a lot to digest, not just what took place over the weekend, but what took place in the last week. Um, and for full transparency, uh, you know, my role as a leader in a lot of these different spaces is to uh, keep a steady hand, keep a calm demeanor, and to really be able to critically think through a lot of the issues that we're dealing with. And how do we uh, ensure a palatable way forward uh, that's effective and gets the actual job done? Um, and to be, you know, to be honest, um, I didn't watch the video. I haven't seen the video. I've obviously heard concerns and the comments about it, but I've been doing this work for almost 20 years. And in those 20 years, um, you know, I've always had a steady pace uh, in understanding that this isn't, this isn't a, a, a sprint, it's a long race. Uh, and so, um, you know, I don't wanna get to a place of burnout but actually in all, in all reality, um, I am super excited by the energy that I see, uh, especially the positive energy. Uh, that march, the marches that we, we we're experiencing in our community specifically as they have been, um, as they have been, you know, motivational. And let me be clear, they have, if it hasn't opened individuals' hearts, a lot of leaders, it has at least opened their ears uh, to even hear uh, the concerns. And let me explain, it's multifaceted. It's not just our police department where we have deficiencies. It's not just you know, other departments in 
the uh, city administration. It is across the board. Um, and so if anybody is connected to me via uh, social media, um, you know, I own it. You know, I, I own where we go wrong and, 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 and I apologize when I can. And in reality is, you know, I need you. I need your help. I need all of my colleagues' help. I need you to continuously, you know, hold individuals accountable. Um, I specifically gave an ask. Any leader, whether it's the city commission, county commission, other municipalities, school board, um, anybody in the justice department, legal department, um, you know, our, our, our uh, WMU, K College, KVCC, you should be giving business leaders, you should be giving them a call. You should be emailing them. And it's a simple ask. And in reality, it's a simple ask. And the question is simple. What are you doing as a leader of whatever entity to ensure the improvement of the quality of life of African-Americans? It's real simple. And allow them to explain to you, you know, what actions that they're taking and on top of that, there's a couple other components that, that is very important. Uh, ensure that they give you measurable items. Ensure that they give you a timeline on how they're gonna uh, work towards those measurable items. Um, and, and I think that's very important. Um, and reality is, you know, I uh, know all of my colleagues have all of the answers. And if we did, this would be fixed by now, right? Um, so we need those constant interactions with the community to hold us accountable, A, um, and, and to B, educate us in different components. Uh, you know, as this transpired, um, obviously because I'm African-American on this commission, I feel that individuals reached out to me uh, in the community, within the departments, uh, from the city to really, uh, you know, whether it was for advice, whether it was for, you know, whatever it may be. Um, the reality is I've never had to manage a crowd of three or 4,000 people. I don't know, you know, I don't know, um, I don't have that years of experience behind that. And, you know, through God's grace and wisdom, you know, I think that, you know, I was able to provide guidance that, that, that was, um, that was right for that moment. But that just goes to show that irregardless of all of the things that I prepared for in that moment, I still wasn't prepared. But it takes, it takes the, 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 the um, it takes the courage that we saw in Commissioner Moore to, to live up to those moments. It takes the courage of other colleagues other individuals who were out there. And, and I, I, I even saw some 18, 19 year olds who, 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 uh, who spoke and said, hey, we're not doing that today. And it takes courage to say that. Um, but, but where I push all of my colleagues and my, my expectation is we got to take courage in what we're doing and move forward. Like reality is, and, and this is, Right now I'm giving you Eric's opinion, Eric's heart. Reality is we've been dealing with this for, you know, generations. If you don't get it, you know, I, I don't mind continuously educating, but at times I'm just gonna have to go around you and move through you. And that's, that's just a reality. Um, so, so in truth, you know, it's been times that, the, that, that uh, city staff have told me no. It's been times where city commission has told me no. Um, and in those times and in those instances, if it's something that I'm passionate about and I'm real about, I don't allow that no to dictate my outcomes that I'm about to accomplish, period. Um, and, and so, you know, what I wanna encourage everybody in our community to do is to continuously engage, but it's gotta be constructive too. The importance of that reality and, and a lot of individuals disagree with me a lot of, in a lot of different spaces on, you know, the need for ongoing protests. But reality is, if you stop this protest today, two weeks from now, we'll be back to business as usual. Whether we, how much gain or outcomes we'll have, I don't know. 
Um, but I truly believe mm -hmm. that we have to have those continuous engagement pieces. And if you are out there in the community and you're not coming to the table, you know, I ask that you simply do. And so I provided a few things that, that I think is important to us moving our agenda forward. Uh, I wanna highlight a couple other things. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of different fronts that I am lifting up continuously. A lot of different plates that I hold at the exact same time, a lot of different hats that I hold at the exact same time. Um, so obviously, you know, we want to address our officers. We want to make sure that uh, we are creating the, 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 the need and the safety for our community. Um, but another thing that, that I want to talk to the community about, because this is what I'm passionate about, is the economics of African-Americans, our business ownership. Uh, if anybody tuned in to our last meeting, uh, you know, I really brought home the conversation around how do we get more generational wealth in the African-American community? And so, uh, you know, there have been individuals and groups who are currently organizing in our community. Um, and I wanted to lift up specifically the refinery. Um, the refinery is a, a marijuana, uh, medical marijuana organization now we're off of Sprinkle Road. And with the marijuana uh, ordinance last week, I asked the city commission to do something at uh, is illegal, um, and it was turned down. And that ask was that African Americans only, or not at only, but on top of the individuals who had convictions, on top of the individuals who lived in certain communities in Kalamazoo, I wanted to add in a third group of African Americans to that equation to say, hey, these individuals deserve social equity. And this is the reason why. And I had conversations prior to that, I had conversations with everybody in the medical industry currently who, who, who own and operate uh, medical marijuana um, uh, businesses. And this individual literally reached out after uh, the scenario happened to Mr. Floyd uh, last week to say, hey, you know, I can't imagine what you're going through, but I just wanna give you my sentiments uh, and I'm sorry that you have to deal with this. But beyond that, today I received an email earlier today to say, I wanna put money where my mouth is. And this individual said he would donate $1,000 to any entity um, to, to try and promote business ownership in our community. Specifically, Eric Cunningham, whoever you say, that's what I'm gonna do. So I just wanted to lift that up, um, that I'm gonna utilize that opportunity. I appreciate that, I appreciate you. I appreciate that individuals don't take offense to uh, you know, my line of thinking or, 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 or my perception on, on, on how we should move forward. Because reality is we're a team and you know, as a team, we have to operate uh, and, and communicate. And so that communication piece is gonna be you know, very important. I know that individuals are scared right now. There's a lot of rumors that's going around. Um, and, and I try to answer questions in real time because, because it's, a, uh, it's a valid fear or a valid frustration. Um, so if you feel comfortable with reaching out to me, I, I, I leave an open door policy. I am on social media. Um, and I just wanna build individuals up in that space um, as much as possible. And then I ended on, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm energized by the energy of all of those who are in my community fighting for what's right. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge that there is a youth rally um, this coming uh, Friday, and actually I didn't even pull up the time, my apologies. Uh, there's a, a youth held rock rally uh, for the voices of our, our youth um, who will be uh, rallying and marching on, um, on Friday uh, in support of this cause uh, to, to, to find ways to create equity, find ways to um, improve the quality of life for African-Americans. Um, and then I'll leave off on um, to those, there was a lot of comments surrounding uh, why our officers left um, no longer send our, our, our uh, cadets to school at KBCC. Uh, 
that is a very imperative question. That is a question that I have been keeping a very close eye on. Um, and I will allow Chief Thomas to respond and report out on that. Um, as she is not here, I won't uh, speak to it, but uh, I just wanted to lift that up and, and acknowledge that that is a very important uh, topic for me uh, and uh, quite a few of my colleagues also. Um, and so uh, we shall, I personally believe, you know, um, you know, that's the goal and that's where we'll be eventually, uh, regardless of where we're at right now. Thank you very much, Commissioner Cunningham. I appreciate you. Commissioner Knott. Thank you. Um, so everyone's aware today's uh, June 1, and that is the beginning of Pride Month. And I think most of us think about pride and we think about rainbow saturated celebrations across the LGBTQ community. And it's easy for us to forget its solemn origins. Um, if you're not aware, the first Pride was a riot. The LGBTQ civil rights movement was born when black and brown trans women had had enough of police raids that resulted in a clash between police and protesters outside of the Stonewall Inn in New York City. The acts of resistance, riots, and rebellions were a direct response to the anger boiling over against a system that devalued and erased LGBTQ lives. That's the origin of pride. The movement was born, which has resulted in many victories for equality for all of us that identify as LGBTQ. But we have more work to do. As I mentioned two weeks ago at our last meeting in Michigan, you can still be fired, denied housing or service because of who you are and who you love. And that's a fact that is exasperated by the current, current uh, pandemic. And let's not forget the brutal epidemic of violence experienced by our black and brown community members, especially the killings of transgender people with, plan, with black trans women of color impacted most um, disproportionately. In 2019, there were at least 26 deaths of transgender people due to fatal violence. Sadly, in 2020, we've already seen 12 transgender people fatally shot or killed. Our nation is plunging into crisis right now. We are gripped by disease, unemployment, and an outrage at the police. The unrest and anger that we are experiencing in cities across the United States is well justified. On a regular basis, we are made aware that a white person whether it's a white supremacist or a racist law enforcement officer kills a black person needlessly. Our nation is so sorely lacking leadership right now, a national leader who will stand up to injustices in our community and not inflame the injustice. When we began our meeting earlier this evening, Trump announced or rather declared himself as the president of law and order. And he did so by firing tear gas and rubber bullets at peaceful protesters so that he could have a photo op outside of a church near the White House. Thousands of heavily armed guards and soldiers will be called to bring order, is a quote from the, uh, from the president. And without this national leadership, it's up to us at the state and local levels to lift up communities of color and bring attention to historical inequities and implicit bias. It's time for my white colleagues and myself to listen and to follow the lead of our black and indigenous people of color in our community. I think in closing, what I wanna say is uh, Commissioner Cunningham had lifted up the fact that all of us today spent time one-on-one -on -one with the city manager and the, and the chief. And I didn't ask questions this evening, but my questions really focused on our lack of communication. On Saturday evening, somewhere between six and 7 p.m., I started seeing notes on Facebook and I received a message from a colleague of mine who talked about what was going down, uh, excuse me, down, um, what was going on downtown Kalamazoo. I reached out to the mayor and to the city manager. I reached out to Commissioner Cunningham um, and I continued that communication over the course of the weekend. And it wasn't until today at 2 p.m. when I had a meeting with the chief and was finally getting some answers to questions that all of us had. And I understand the situation and I appreciate the fact that um, intelligence needed to be gathered, uh, that we needed to review film. I mean, there was a bunch of circumstances, but the narrative had been shaped. As Mayor Anderson discussed earlier, uh, social media gets out ahead of us and without answers from us as leaders, from the city manager or the chief of police in real time, we left our community with a, a major gap in communication and, and folks wondered and folks were hurting needlessly over the weekend. And so my questions to the chief and to the city manager and to the manager's office was how do we do better as it relates to communicating 
with the public in real time so that information isn't disseminated by way of social media and mistruths are told. And if we have to face hard questions and we have to own how we've impacted people or, or created trauma for whatever the reason is, then we need to get that information out in real time and not let 48 or so hours go before we communicate publicly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Knapp. Commissioner Prado. <clears throat> sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, just wanted to echo to thank uh, Police Chief and City Manager and City Staff for spending so much time with us today. Um, I know a number of us were on phone with uh, either colleagues or city staff. Um, also today, just you know, asking a barrage of questions and and trying to make sure that as many questions uh, were answered tonight. And so um, grateful for her time. And I know um, you know it was abundantly clear that Chief Thomas has not slept much. Um, you know, you can see on her face um, her exhaustion, and and that that comes from deep care um, that she takes the lives of every single person in this community seriously. Um, it's a big job. And um, so we kind of, you know, we continue to, to, to hold her up. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, I guess, one of the paradoxes of, of this past weekend. You know, while we watched the SpaceX NASA mission uh, ignite into outer space, you know, down here on Earth, we watched cars and buildings ignite into flames. You know, while we watched uh, the first uh, American since 2011, launch into space and hug some of our uh, most geopolitical enemies uh, on the International Space Station. Here on Earth, people who live just miles apart from each other fought with each other on our streets. I think uh, more than anything, I think I just wanted to kind of lift up the fact that, you know, if anything can be exemplified from that mission into space is that you know, we can do hard things. And unlike uh, a mission into space that takes brilliant engineers and scientists to get us there, the reality is, is the way forward with this crisis that we face in our community and across the country is working together. And uh, the reality is, is that it's not going to take any one expert. It's going to take all of us. And um, predominantly, uh, just wanted to especially emphasize whether uh, knowingly or un wittingly, uh, white Americans uh, in this country uh, have perpetuated this for generations. And it needs to uh, lie more on our backs and responsibility uh, to lift up these issues and to recognize that institutional and systemic racism exists today in our community and around the country. Um, I uh, continue to keep uh, my colleagues um, friends and neighbors, uh, people of color who uh, bear an incredible emotional burden uh, time and time again. And uh, I feel for that pain and that, um, that trauma and that emotional burden uh, that you carry. And uh, I just want to, I hope um, that everyone during these already kind of emotionally difficult times during COVID um, where everybody's stretched thin and everybody is uh, reeling in pain, uh, that people hopefully take care of themselves and take care of, of, of their spiritual selves, their uh, emotional selves, um, because this is a hard, hard, hard time. Thank you very much, Commissioner Pradle. Uh, so I'm kind of looking at Commissioner Urban, you were. Oh, let Jean go. I, I want to be. Okay, you defer again. Three okay. defers, you're out. Just All right. Commissioner Hess. Save the best for last. Oh, no. Uh, so anyway, uh, yeah, I would also like to lift up gratitude to Chief Thomas and all the officers um, from Kalamazoo Department of Public Safety, and especially say it's public safety. Um, there were thousands of people downtown this weekend. As I attended the protest, I did feel the flood of emotion of all of the people gathered, uh, especially as a white person who is implicit in all of this. Um, so what I, uh, what I understood and realized is that 
we are at the meeting of, of two global pandemics, really, of COVID and of systemic racism. Um, and both take your breath away. Um, and so uh, I, I, I heard a, a quote by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was just in Kalamazoo a few years ago and uh, uh, has written extensively and now has spoken out extensively about racism in America. And he said today, racism in America is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even when you're choking on it until you let the sun in. Well, here in Kalamazoo, I believe the sun has come up. And I believe that in Kalamazoo, we have a community that is both big enough to have an impact, but small enough to do this work. We have to do it together. I'll continue to be a voice for the education for all from pre-K through through college and beyond um, and through adulthood. Education, I believe, is the way out of this. Dialogue is the way out of this. Working together is the way. Um, and so uh, as the signs say about COVID, we're all in this together. We are all in this together. Um, and I, like Chief Thomas, am praying for unity for all. Uh, I was privileged this evening to read the bullying um, proclamation. At a systemic level, we are really working deeply on the biggest issue of bullying that has happened for generations. Uh, I look forward to working with my colleagues and, and I have to say that this commission is one of great power and I have great privilege to sit on it on behalf of all the people of Kalamazoo. So, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hess. Appreciate that. I don't want to ask, Mr. Urban, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I wrote a comment in, uh, in, uh, uh, on Facebook about how impressed I was with the the youth uh, uh, and the numbers of people that came uh, downtown uh, Saturday evening for the march. Uh, and I got a reply back. Uh, well, uh, well, first of all, I added a sentence that said that, well, it would be great if we saw that great number of people uh, who were over 30 in that crowd. And someone wrote back to me saying, well, uh, the people over 30 are the people who are the problem. Uh, and uh, they wouldn't be welcome in that crowd because they're the uh, uh, the people who are in the power and who have, uh, uh, are embedded in the uh, racist infrastructure of the country. And uh, so that took me back a bit. Uh, but my statement I made, I think, I want to just take this opportunity to say is still true. If another... 3,500 to 4,000 people showed up that were my age, that would be huge because that would be indicating that there's been a transformation <laughs> in white culture uh, among people of my age, and that would be terrific. So uh, that's what uh, I hope will happen because uh, just waiting for us to die off is not going to be quick enough. Uh, we have gotten, uh, uh, been waking up slowly, slowly. But it, it increasing in speed uh, in the last few years and increasing even this week. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that we're, I feel blessed to be part of this city commission. I think that uh, 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 we uh, understand one another and we respect one another and we honor one another. I, I'm especially uh, proud of what, uh, Commissioner Cunningham has been able to do and to say in the last few weeks. Uh, he is a model uh, that we can follow. Uh, I am more than willing to learn from him. Uh, I may be older, <laughs> but I'm still learning. Uh, finally, I'd like to say that uh, 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 from my perspective that comes from age, uh, it's clear that uh, with the widespread use of social media, we, we get our news faster uh, than ever, almost instantaneously. And that's wonderful. It uh, makes us feel a part of what's happening. 
and it's very exciting. But often the information that we get that way is incomplete and not in context. So I urge you to be patient and to wait for more facts to come in and try to get independent verification of what is presented to you. I can tell you, I can't tell you <laughs> how many times I've made mistakes and some were pretty expensive because I acted on incomplete information. I didn't take enough of a deep breath to really think it through and I did something foolish. Take it from me, take a deep breath, learn all you can and act with wisdom. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Urban. Vice Mayor Griffin. Thank you. Um, I just, I'm gonna start off um, with acknowledging today, June 1st is uh, the 99 year anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa massacre. Um, many of you may be familiar with the term Black Wall Street where 300 or so black businesses uh, were destroyed. Uh, mob stormed the areas in 24 hours, 35 square blocks were burned, 1200 houses were destroyed. And this is an area that was primarily uh, built, not primarily, it was 100% black built, black owned. Um, and so I just wanna start with that um, and kind of lean into what it takes um, for revolution to happen in, in this country. Um, as commissioner, not just lifted up with uh, the beginning of this month and how uh, the celebrations uh, for pride even started came with turmoil, it came with pain. Um, and unfortunately that is what comes with bringing about change. And so for all of the folks um, who were newly outraged or what happened uh, with George Floyd sparked um, something in you to want to do want to do something. I'm definitely grateful for that. I want to send a huge shout out to organizers out there who really spend the time and take the time to learn and put the effort in because what the public may not realize is that these actions, these protests, there are people who put long hours in, put work in, to organize. This is not a haphazard event that people just decide one day they want to do something. No, it's very calculated. It's very, very intentional. And I, I thank everyone who uh, wants to, who, who gets the notion to want to do something. I just want to encourage folks to check in with people who really do this work um, all the time to make sure that what efforts that you want to push forth have the most impact um, so that people are safe at all times. I am one of those folks who have been on the front lines. I have protested here. I protested in DC. I've been a marshal at protests. I get it. I'm with you. I'm, I'm all for that. Um, I want to say to the community as some of our, uh, some of the other commissioners have already lifted up. <clears throat> I found out like everyone else did um, through community, through social media, um, the events that happened uh, the events that happened Saturday. And so I too had a chance to sit down uh, with the chief and some city staff. And so my question, my comment was uh, the community needs to see this, which is what the community was able to see today. And my comment was, or my question was, well, what are the procedures uh, for the crowd management team? And so I say that to say, Moving forward, I guess I'll backtrack a little bit. Um, for me, this work, this is every day. Injustices that happen, when these things, um, like what happened with George Floyd happened, those, those sparks that get the country and, and people in an uproar, I feel that way. I felt that way two weeks ago. I felt that way two months ago. I'm gonna feel that way in another three months um, when sometimes things go down. Um, die down. And I'm going to encourage everyone who's really excited and wants to do something to keep that same passion, keep that same energy, because this work is not a sprint. I repeat, it is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It's going to take a lot of work. We're talking about systems here. We're talking about 
for this particular instance, racism that is embedded into a culture of, of, of this, this nation. That's not gonna change overnight, but it absolutely can change. And what it's gonna take is real action, real plans, because I, folks, we're hearing George Floyd's name now, but please don't forget Eric Gardner. He couldn't breathe in, in 2014. And so what we need to make sure is that that doesn't happen in this community. We need to make sure that no officers are on the necks of anybody in this community. That's what I'm interested in. No, no one's perfect. No department is perfect. No systems are perfect. We got that. We're clear on that. But what are we going to do for Kalamazoo to make sure that that doesn't happen? I'm interested in transparency. I'm interested in letting the community know, you know, what, what their procedures are. I'm interested in, in wanting to know what officers, what their rates are as far as violent behaviors. Are there uh, uh, patterns of behavior that we can see? Is there something we can do with that? That's what I'm interested in, actual system change. And I'm, I'm hoping, and I know there are folks out here in the community that are interested in that. So I'm hoping that you stay on this with us. Um, I will speak for myself and say that that's, that's a mission that I'm on. And um, I just really wanna let everyone know who's out here feeling this pain. Um, I, I feel it too. Um, I don't know what to say, right? I, I don't. Um, I wish I had those answers. I, I still am processing myself every day as a mother, as a black woman, um, as a wife of a black man who has trauma behind these things. Um, but we can have real action steps. We're not looking for the band-aid here. We're not looking for the simple um, brush over. We're looking so that the next the next folks, uh, the next commission, the next people that are in the position of, of officers, that we don't have that happen again. So with that, um, I just wanna remind everyone that COVID-19 is still happening. We still have to deal with these precautions. So just everyone still be aware, um, take care. And as Commissioner Cunningham said, please reach out to us. I'm available, we're all available um, and we will get better. Thank you. Commissioner Cunningham. Um, Mayor, I have one request. Um, I've been kind of keeping an eye on the feed as, on, on live. Um, can I request uh, to have the last word uh, after you speak and adjourn our meeting? Sure. Uh, I, so I'm totally fine with that. Uh, you want to do maybe not after the meeting's adjourned? Or do you want to? I mean, you want to go ahead and adjourn the meeting? Is that, is that something wanna, that can? If I can give the last word and then adjourn the meeting. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. So a few things tonight. Uh, first of all, I just want to uh, announce, if it's not already obvious to everybody, that I am indeed a flawed person. I'm not always going to get everything right. And... That doesn't mean I'm not going to keep trying, and I don't believe uh, deeply in in the work that we do and trying to keep moving that forward. I am a lucky person in that I get to serve with uh, six smart people who were wisely elected by individuals in the city of Kalamazoo to serve together on this commission, and that. By doing this together as a group of leaders, that gives us uh, seven times better chances to come up with the right idea and the right approach in any given moment. And I reflected on that today as we had our individual discussions, and I got to be there for every one of them with the commissioners, is that in any given moment, you don't know who might have the better idea, the wiser thought. Uh, the appropriate uh, response or way to move forward at any given time. And so I am completely dependent on the fact that I've got uh, this group of folks close to me who will continue to do that work. And I'm also going to suggest that it doesn't stop there. It's in the community. And so keep thinking, uh, keep working, keep sending those good ideas on. I appreciate that. At the same time, we're talking about this. We've been talking about 
what did happen a couple of days ago, uh, we are going to be facing ongoing uh, protests, ongoing opportunities for people to gather in public spaces. And as a matter of fact, I think from what I understand, we may have uh, one going on later this evening. So this is what I ask. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, let's build, let's not destroy. Let's work together. Express your feelings and your concerns and your grief and your anger as vociferously and directly as you feel that you need to do. But let's please not put other people at risk. Let's not take this opportunity to perhaps destroy things that folks have taken time to build up for this community. So please, please think of that as you're involved in what is appropriate, uh, demonstrating and making your voices heard. I do believe that we are at a tipping point. I believe that we are going to need to come out of this uh, with real live action plans that we're going to be working on immediately as we go forward. My normal closing would be keep your hearts open. I love you, Kalamazoo. And I would be following that with one other uh, word. And I'm going to pass that over to Commissioner Cunningham tonight. Um, thank you, uh, Honorable David Anderson, um, for even allowing me to, you know, do something that's been, that's, that's definitely unorthodox, but allowed us to really signify um, that we are serious about the work. Uh, if I felt that any of my colleagues uh, didn't have that hat on, uh, you know, I would call it out for what it is. Uh, the reality is um, each commissioner has certain skills and I think each one of us rely on each other for those skill sets. And then although David Anderson is our, our mayor, he is our leader, he is, he's only been in his job for a few months and in the job for a few months, he is still allowing other individuals in this space to be leaders also. Um, and and I, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that. Um, I didn't have any extra words. I, I stated what I stated earlier, but I do want to speak to, to a couple of things. Uh, once again, I, I gave action items. I need everybody to definitely reach out uh, and, and give your thoughts, give your opinions. Um, it, there was questions on why haven't we did a resolution? Uh, in, a, in all honesty, uh, you know, our mayor brought that up. Uh, and, and so uh, I think collectively we decided uh, we want to bring a resolution forward. Um, with the intent of, of real true intent of creating the change that we need. Um, so we're going back to the table uh, and we're drawing up some plans. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor and I will be sitting at the table in a couple of days to really sit down and, and debrief uh, and think through some of these things that, that we wanna achieve and what we wanna accomplish. The last piece I wanna leave you all with is, you know, I've been in contact, co constant contact with, you know, everybody in my family. And if you know me, both sides, my mother and my father, we, we about 300 deep in Kalamazoo, at least on the east side. Um, and I've been in contact with the uh, spiritual leaders in the community, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of our pastors and bishops. Um, and, and I've also been in contact with my, what I call my hood. Uh, and nobody is calling for riots. Nobody is calling for violence. So I'm gonna double down on some of the comments that our mayor made. Uh, in that, you know, that's not what anybody who is my color, my complexion is calling for in this community. What we are calling for is action. And what we are calling for is that those who want to get out, engage, now is your time and we open the door to it. Um, and, and I leave it at, these are seven individuals with, uh, with city staff who are trying to move agendas forward but as well as a lot more entities in this community that need to be addressed, dismantled, spoken to, uh, built up, however you wanna, you know, you wanna approach it, um, but we have to be intentional. Uh, so with that, um, I get the honor of something that, that I probably would never do because I don't aspire to have your job, David. Uh, we are adjourned and I love you.